Welcome to the Italia Life channel. I'm Michelle and I coach caregivers to be confident in their abilities to care for themselves first and then help others. Are you ready to put yourself first for a change? Subscribe to the channel and let's go. On the Italia Life channel, I encourage caregivers to be proactive instead of reactive about their health and well-being. And there are three things about the book Becoming that resonated with me. The first is feeling resentment towards others. In Mrs. Obama's role as a wife and mother, she felt some resentment. The second thing is realizing your role in your happiness. Mrs. Obama eloquently talks about that and that aha moment was priceless. And the third thing that resonated was that creating routines can support your needs. Simple and efficient. That's what Mrs. Obama learned and that's what she shares. Take a listen. Please note, the content has been edited for continuity. This was the new math in our family. We had two kids, three jobs, two cars, one condo, and what felt like no free time. I accepted the new position at the hospital. Barack continued teaching and legislating. We both served on boards of several nonprofits. And as much as he had been stung by his defeat in the congressional primary, Barack still had ideas about trying for a higher office. I don't recall exactly when it was that he first raised the possibility of running for a seat in the U.S. Senate. What I do remember is my response, which was just to look at him as if to say, don't you think we're busy enough? My distaste for politics was only intensifying. As Sasha and Malia grew, I found that the pace only quickened and the to-do list only got longer, leaving me operating in what felt like a never-ending state of overdrive. Barack and I did all we could to keep the girls' lives calm and manageable. We had a new babysitter helping out at home. Malia was happy at her school making friends and loading up on her own calendar with birthday parties and swim classes on the weekends. Sasha was now a one-year-old, wobbling on two feet and beginning to say words. My hospital job was going well, though the best way to stay on top of it, I was discovering, was to hoist myself from bed at 5 a.m and put in a couple of hours on the computer before anyone else woke up. This left me a little ragged in the evenings and sometimes put me in direct conflict with my night owl husband, who turned up on Thursday nights from Springfield, relatively chipper and wanting to dive headfirst into family life, making up for all the time he'd lost. But time was now officially an issue for us. I can relate to that. Time has been an issue for me. Who hasn't felt like their to-do list got twice as long once you realize your child needs something that you forgot to add to the list or you're caring for a parent with dementia or a chronic illness, you know what the issue of time feels like. I knew that Thursdays made him happy. I'd hear his excitement when he called to report that he was done with work and finally headed home. I understood it was nothing but good intentions that would lead him to say, I'm on my way or almost home. And for a while, I believed those words. I'd give the girls their nightly bath, but to lay bedtime so that they could wait up to give their dad a hug. Or I'd feed them dinner and put them to bed, but hold off on eating myself, lighting a few candles and looking forward to sharing a meal with Barack. And then I'd wait. I'd wait so long that Sasha Malia's eyelids would start to droop and I'd have to carry them to bed. On my way, I was learning, was the product of Barack's eternal optimism an indication of his eagerness to be home and did nothing to signify when he actually would arrive. Almost home was not a geolocator, but rather a state of mind. Sometimes he was on his way, but needed to stop in to have one last 45 minute conversation with a colleague before he got into the car. Other times he was almost home, but forgot to mention that he was going first to fit in a quick workout at the gym. In our life before children, such frustrations might have seemed petty, but as a working full-time mother with a half-time spouse and a pre-dawn wake-up time, I felt my patience slipping away until finally, at some point, it just fell off a cliff. Feeling like your patience is slipping away. Oh my gosh. That really hit home for me because I know that feeling. Feeling like you have a full-time spouse who's a part-time parent. There is resentment that's going to build up for you towards your partner. My partner at one point worked nights. So that was the time that I was home with the kids alone for dinner, bath time, bedtime, all of that. 
resentment really can grow in those gray areas. And I totally understand how Miss Obama felt about that. You're trying to be a super parent and still feel like you're failing. When Barack made it home, he'd either find me raging or unavailable, having flipped off every light in the house and gone sullenly to sleep. When it came down to it, I felt vulnerable when he was away, not because he wasn't fully devoted to our marriage, but because having been brought up in a family where everyone always showed up, I could be extra let down when someone didn't show. I was prone to loneliness and now also felt fierce about sticking up for the girl's needs too. We wanted him close. We missed him when he was gone. I worried that he didn't understand what that felt like for us. Sometimes watching the news or reading the paper, I found myself staring at images of the people who had given themselves over to political life. The Clintons, the Gores, the Bushes, old photos of the Kennedys, and wondering what the backstories were. Was everyone normal? Happy? Were those smiles real? At home, our frustrations began to rear up often and intensely. Barack and I loved each other deeply, but it was at the center of our relationship that there was suddenly a knot we couldn't loosen. I was 38 years old and had seen other marriages come undone in a way that made me feel protective of ours. Barack was reluctant at first to try couples counseling. He was accustomed to throwing his mind at a complicated problem and reasoning them out on his own. And so I booked us an appointment with a downtown psychologist who came recommended by a friend. I began to see that there were ways I could be happier and that they didn't necessarily need to come from Barack's quitting politics in order to take some nine to six foundation job. I began to see how I'd been stoking the negative parts of myself, caught up in the notion that everything was unfair, collecting evidence to feed my hypothesis. I now tried out a new hypothesis. It was possible that I was more in charge of my happiness than I was allowing myself to be. I was too busy resenting Barack for managing to fit workouts into his schedule, for example, to even begin figuring out how to exercise regularly myself. I spent so much energy stewing over whether or not he'd make it home for dinner that that dinners with or without him were no longer fun. This was my pivot point, my moment of self-arrest. Barack and I belonged to the same gym. I'd worked out with Cornell for a couple years, but having children had changed my regular schedule. My fix for this came in the form of my ever-giving mother, who still worked full-time but volunteered to start coming over to our house at 4.45 in the morning several days a week so that I could run out to Cornell's and join a girlfriend for a 5 a.m. workout and then be home by 6.30 to get the girls up and ready for their days. This new regimen changed everything. Calmness and strength, two things I feared I was losing, were now back. When it came to the home for dinner dilemma, I installed new boundaries, ones that worked better for me and the girls. We made our schedule and stuck to it. Dinner each night was at 6.30. Baths were at 7, followed by books, cuddling, and lights out at 8 o'clock sharp. The routine was ironclad, which put the weight of responsibility on Barack to either make it in time or not. For me, this made so much more sense than holding off on dinner, having the girls wait up sleepily for a hug, it went back to my wishes for them to grow up strong and centered and unaccommodating to any form of old school patriarchy. I didn't want them to ever believe that life began when the man of the house arrived home. We didn't wait for dad. It was his job now to catch up with us. So as caregivers, I encourage people to be proactive instead of reactive. We can feel resentment in our role as caregiver, whether you're a parent a child taking care of an aging parent, or you're working professionally as a caregiver. Resentment grows. Take time to write in your journal to really understand the parts everyone plays in how you're feeling. Second, realize your role in your happiness. You are the captain of your ship and the name of your ship is happiness. So sail it to wherever it needs to go. Those aha moments that you'll have will be priceless. But first you have to realize your role and what makes you happy and go for that. Lastly, create routines. Our kids get routines 
in school, in their extracurricular activities. So there is no reason that a positive routine at home can't be beneficial. It will be beneficial for your kids at home. So create a routine for yourself, for your kids, that helps everybody be happy. And it makes life so much sweeter. All right, nice people. Until the next time, take care of you. If you would like to start your self-care journey, please download a free copy of our self-care series.